Hey guys, and welcome to Step 3 Review. <clears throat> In this uh, series of kind of podcasts, we're going to go through a uh, ton of Step 3 material, basically all the wrong questions I got on UWorld, review some topics together, and then hopefully we'll have something by the end that uh, resembles a comprehensive review of important things to know about the exam. So let's get started with um, a little bit about murmurs. This is a very commonly tested topic. First and most important one is aortic stenosis. This is uh, a stenosing of the aortic valve where you have concentric hypertrophy of the left ventricle. So because the blood can't go out of the left ventricle into the aorta, now you're having the ventricle hypertrophying to compensate for that stenotic valve. You have a elderly person usually, and this elderly person presents with something like a syncope where they stand up too quickly, the blood stops going to their brain because of the aortic stenosis is stopping it. So elderly plus syncope, always suspect aortic stenosis as one of your culprits. You'll have a systolic murmur, duh, and this radiates to the carotids, and you'll see something called parvus, pulsus parvus and tardis, so that's a, a delayed pulse. If you're listening with your stethoscope, the carotid uh, pulsation is not going to match up. It's going to be a little slow. Um, Usually these valves are calcified, and if you see someone that's not elderly, let's say someone, a young person with aortic stenosis, you suspect the bicuspid aortic valve because in those people, the wear and tear on the aortic valve is a lot stronger uh, because they have two valves rather than three. Um, classic person here to look out for is someone with Turner's syndrome. Those people have XO genotype. So aortic stenosis, elderly, um, person with syncope, someone with a bicuspid valve that's young, like in Turner syndrome, and uh, you need to replace this valve if they have any symptoms of heart failure, or if they have syncope, or if they have angina from this uh, condition. So those are the important things to know there. Aortic regurgitation. So this is a murmur heard best at the left lower sternal border. So if you imagine the aortic stenosis murmurs at the top right of the chest, this is in the opposite direction because the flow is literally going the opposite way. This murmur presents with a wide pulse pressure. So usually to trick you, they'll give you a normal systolic pressure and then they'll give you a really low diastolic, like 40 or something. And then you'll look at the systolic, you'll miss the diastolic, and then you'll miss the diagnosis. Here, more blood is building up on the left side of the heart because of the regurgitation, so this actually increases your cardiac output, and you treat the condition by decreasing afterload. So classically with aortic regurg, you'll have head bobbing. This is a water hammer pulse. That's what it's, the terminology is because the uh, flow of blood is just pulsating so strongly the person's head is shaking. Then we have mitral stenosis. This is classically associated with rheumatic fever. So uh, you'll have an upper respiratory infection, something like three years ago. It won't be recent. You need time to build up those antibodies and destroy the mitral valve. So it's not going to be like an infection they had last week. The EKG will show <coughs> uh, AFib in these people. So remember that mitral stenosis is classically associated with AFib. Why is that? Well, because the right atrium is going to get dilated. The mitral valve is stenosed, causing the right atrium to kind of balloon up because the flow is not going into the right ventricle. And the SA node is in the right atrium. So you're going to have the SA node getting stretched. And when the SA node stretches, you get electrical activity that doesn't work very well. So that causes AFib. And you're, so you're going to have a diastolic murmur and someone with AFib, potential rheumatic fever. Um, <clears throat> and in these cases, especially if you have mitral stenosis and AFib, you want to get a CHADS VASC score. And remember, if they have the stenosis and a high CHADS VASC, you don't want to use a new anticoagulant. You want to use warfarin. That's going to be another common way they'll trick you. So they'll, they'll give you the mitral stenosis, they'll give you the AFib, and then they'll say, you know, how do you, how do you anticoagulate this person? And it's going to be warfarin, not one of the newer anticoagulants, a pixaban, and so on. Mitral prolapse. So mitral prolapse is associated with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, Marfan syndrome, even some psychotic disorders. And in this one, you're going to have the mid-systolic click. 
So mitral regurge, how you differentiate it from mitral prolapse just by listening to it, is mitral regurge is going to be hollow systolic. But mitral prolapse, you're going to have this mid-systolic clip where the, where the valve literally prolapses back into the right atrium. And <clears throat> the reason for mitral regurge is the valves do not overlap properly. So actually, if you increase the left ventricular uh, pressure or the left ventricular amount of blood that's in there, you're going to stretch out the left ventricle, cause the valve to overlap properly, and this will actually decrease the murmur. So afterload decreases the murmur, and mitral regurg afterload increases the murmur because you have more flow backwards through that uh, regurgitating valve. Okay, and the classic keyword for mitral regurg here is myxomatous degeneration of the valve. Next we have VSD and ASD. Just remember that VSD is a hollow systolic left lower sternal murmur. And ASD, there's a couple two, a couple of things to remember. It's going to be a wide fixed split S2 murmur. So whether you inhale or exhale, the S2, the A and P portions of it are going to be split equally. Um, <clears throat> and there's going to be um, two types. So there's primum type and secundum type for ASDs. So primum type is actually mostly found with people with Down syndrome. If it's just a regular uh, ASD, then you're going to have usually secundum type. That's the most common one. Next we have hokum. So that's hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. This is a left ventricle outflow disease. It's found in out athletes with uh, syncope and uh, sudden death. So. In these cases, myosin binding protein is mutated. There's going to be a systolic ejection murmur that's best heard in the left lower sternal border. And it also does not radiate to the carotids. So if you want to differentiate this uh, from ASD, you just listen to the uh, from aortic, aortic stenosis, sorry, not ASD. You want to listen to the carotids. Um, <clears throat> in this case, you'll have something called pulsus bisphreniensis or bifid pulse in which case you're going to have a basically a stepwise pulse and uh, when you listen to them and you'll have a uh, two little blips when you feel the pulse instead of one and <clears throat> you treat this basically with uh, beta blockers so you want to increase in these people you want to increase the amount of diastolic filling time because it's going to improve the murmur. The more you fill hokum, the better it will be because it's hypertrophied. It's going to want to squeeze down and not allow much blood to enter. The more you fill it, the more opening there is, the less outflow obstruction. Okay, and then uh, let's go through a few maneuvers that you do with classic murmurs. Squatting, just remember that increases preload and valsalva increases afterload. So when you squat, you literally squeeze the blood out of your legs back to your heart. And when you do Valsalva, you are compressing uh, the aorta. You're straining against it. You're clamping down on the diaphragm, which is going to cause an increase in afterload. <sighs> All right, aortic aneurysms. What's the, what's, what do you have to know about that? They're caused by cystic medial degeneration, and this is classically associated with syphilis. Carcinoid syndrome is another important one, which is associated with the tricuspid and aortic valves because it spreads to the liver and then the right side of the heart. And if it gets to the aortic valve, then you really got a really late stage carcinoid. Uh, usually it'll go to the tricuspid first. When you, in, uh, when you get an echo, when do you get an echo for any heart disease? So if the systolic versus diastolic echo requirements are different. Uh, for systolic, you have to have at least a three out of six systolic murmur. Every diastolic murmur gets an echo because systolic murmurs can be physiologic while diastolics are always pathogenic. And then if you have symptoms, it's another criteria. Next, we're gonna talk about uh, PDA in PEATS. So um, persistent ductus arteriosus is a continuous wide fixed split S2 murmur. It's machine-like. You're going to have, uh, you're going to need a workup. It's a right-sided murmur. So the one that you have to differentiate PDA from is venous hum. So PDA is going to be on the right side. 
Venus hum is going to be on the left side. And basically, Venus hum is uh, just a subclavian vein that's uh, turbulent, and while PDA is a patent ductus arteriosus. The treatment for PDA is endomethacin because you stop prostaglandins, and this causes uh, the duct to close. Prostaglandins keep the duct open. And then uh, if you, so for example, if you have a child with a congenital heart malformation, sometimes you will give uh, prostaglandins in order to keep that PDA open so the child can survive. Next, so venous hum, it's totally benign. Uh, there's just turbulence in the sub, uh, SVC and it's left-sided. So make sure you differentiate which side your hum is on with the child because that'll tell you if it's PDA on the right versus venous hum on the left. And you do nothing for venous hum. Let's talk about uh, sepsis next. We're just going to go through some random topics until eventually I get bored and then we'll, we'll stop for the day. Septic shock. So septic shock is caused by vasodilation, a decrease in systolic, uh, systemic venous resistance. And then this uh, decreases afterload, which then increases cardiac output. Pressures are usually lower in the left atrium and the right atrium because there's less, less afterload to push against. And this is going to decrease your pulmonary capillary load wedge pressure and your central venous pressure. So pulmonary cavity wedge pressure is your left atrial pressure, and then central venous pressure is your right atrial pressure. Just remember those, they like to trip you up by switching those two terms around. Then you have something called mixed venous O2 sat, which is basically your heart's ability, your tissue's ability to squeeze out uh, O2 from the blood. Uh, so this is actually increased in septic shock because the more dilated your blood vessels are, the more inefficient oxygen can be extracted from them. So you're going to actually have more O2 in your veins than before. And uh, what are the criteria for sepsis? So you need two of the SERS criteria to be diagnosed with sepsis. There's temperature, heart rate, respiratory rate, PaCO2, WBCs, and source. So how I kind of remember this is uh, you think of basically you have the heart, which heart rate greater than 90. Then you have two things for the lungs, respiratory rate and PaCO2, which is uh, respiratory rate greater than uh, 20 and PaCO2 of less than 32 because you're breathing, you're not able to efficiently, uh, you're, you're hyperventilating and so your PaCO2 will go uh, down and white cells greater than 12,000. So one thing for the heart, one thing for the blood, two things for the lungs, and then temperature and source. That's overall, there's six criteria. Usually they won't force you to memorize them, but they will give you more than two of these. And if you can find more than two of these, then you know you have a positive sepsis diagnosis. Um, what else can we talk about? Ne neurogenic shock. So we're, we're on the topic of shock. Let's cover more shock principles. Neurogenic shock is usually caused by spinal injury or spinal abscess. In, in this kind of shock, your, your sympathetics are knocked down. You have a decreased uh, sympathetic outflow to the heart and decreased vascular tone because the sympathetics also control vascular tone. So basically you're dilated and it's very similar actually to, to sepsis without the obvious infection most of the time unless you probably have the abscess. Cardiogenic shock is when the heart can't output enough. It's tamponade, heart failure. So cardiac output in cardiogenic shock goes down and systemic vascular resistance goes up to try to compensate. PCWP and CVP, those are left and right ventricle pressures, remember, are high because the heart is not able to pump the blood out, so it builds up inside. And then mixed venous O2 sat is low because the tissues are now able to extract. This isn't a vascular issue, it's a heart issue. So the tissues are able to extract the oxygen. And now you're going to have mixed venous O2 that is low. Hypovolemic shock. So this is a type of shock where you have low blood volume, uh, either because you're pooping it out through diarrhea or you're vomiting or you got stabbed and you're bleeding. So basically your preload goes down. Your preload goes down, your cardiac output goes down, systemic vascular resistance is going to try to go up to compensate, 
and then PCWP and CVP are going to be low because you can't fill up the heart. So you can see here that PCWP and CVP, those, those pressures in the left and right ventricle usually match each other. If they don't, look out for something that's uh, in between them. So look out for a lung pathology, look out for a ventricular pathology, and you guys will be able to quickly discern that this is an intracardiac thing or an intrapulmonary.